So OTK, it confused me at first what it was. And I think it's important to figure out what this team is, what this team advertises itself as versus what it is. There are five people that are starting OTK. Asmongold, SFAN TV, Ms. Kiff, and then you've got two people that are um, running it. Tips, and the fifth dude is Rich. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, notably, let's structure it this way, because I think this is the easiest way to understand it. When they first advertised this, I thought that this was a actual, like, esports org. And it is, right? But it's actually better to think about it, at least for now, as a content network. The, the, the easiest corollary here, the analogy here, would be offline TV. This would be the closest thing. It's a group of content creators who have people that are focusing on the business that are building the um, building the structure of what this is going to be. And that is a really important distinction for later, okay? So, so, so they are not launching like a, a traditional esports team. All of these events, these events are content events, right? And they do have an esports team that they've picked up and we'll talk about that. And it is go I do believe it's going to be a legitimate esports org, but we're gonna talk about the differences between that. And I think to do that, so that's basically what OTK is. OTK, uh, the OTK network, right, is the these current three streamers Two people running it full time, and then they're going to be hiring other people, graphics designers, video editors, people like that. Okay. Uh, and then they may or may not be bringing other streamers into the network. I think that they eventually will, but I don't think that will happen for a while. Um, I think that they'll bring other talent in, and they'll probably eventually have other esports teams. But anyway, let's break it down. In this day and age, there's basically two ways to start an esports team. Let's call it an esports org, because I think an esports org versus esports team are two separate things. There's a right way and a wrong way. There's a good way and a bad way. And I get questions every single day about how do you start an esports org? What is the proper way to start an esports org? So I intend to answer those questions along with doing this talk as well. The first way to start an esports org, which you see the most commonly, is you get investment capital. You use that to pick up a team. And then you use that to join a franchise league, which could be like LCS, CDL, um, OWL, or a major eSport. And then you kind of run on red burn rate and spend a lot of money hoping to get ROI and build a brand at the same time. So most of the esports orgs that have gotten started in the last five years have been under this model. Out of them, almost nobody is making money. And the people that are making money are actually following the second one that we're going to talk about here, which is the, uh, I would call this uh, content organic first, okay? So this is start with or pick up high-powered content creators. Uh, top 200 Twitch. Build a brand, a feeling, and launch apparel slash content and events. Monetize via above. Pick up esports teams uh, as expenses allow. Do not take investment until significantly later, if ever. So for the people that are listening, what is the number one team that has followed this model to incredible success that I talk about all the time? That is 100 Thieves. 100 Thieves started with Nade Shot and Nick Merckx. So they had two very high-powered content creators, very quickly brought other people in, like Courage, like Valkyrie, right? And then built a brand and kind of a feeling, a sort of streetwear feeling, sort of they built their business off of this and only took investment after they already had their brand built. And they monetize through apparel drops, through their brand, because the, the reality in esports, right, is that the esports team that you have is not going to make you money. It is going to be a cash negative thing, no matter what you do. There are very few teams, if any teams at all, that are in franchise leagues that are making any money. They spent an enormous amount of money just to be there, 
So in the case of CDL or OWL, upwards of $25 million to $30 million just to have a slot. They're paying a publisher for that. They're paying Activision that. Now, to make your money back, because pretty much the only way that you're going to make money as an esports org is by sponsorships. But what do sponsors care about? Do sponsors care that you're in a big league and have a bunch of teams? No. Sponsors don't care about that. Sponsors care about impressions, engagement, eyeballs, right? And they care about eyeballs on you, your team, your brand, your feeling. They don't care about eyeballs on OWL because if they did, they just sponsor OWL. Why, why would you sponsor an individual esports team in OWL if you can go and you can just sponsor OWL and you can get the whole thing? You'll just go through the publisher and you'll get a bulk discount. So there's no reason to do that. So for this reason, if you try to start an esports team by getting an investment and joining a league, what, what's going to happen is you're going to spend an enormous amount of money getting into that league and you're going to be paying premium for those players because every one of those players is going to be part of a league. There are, in some cases like LCS, they're going to have minimums, so you're going to have to pay them at least $100,000 a year, if not more, right? Uh, for every single one of them. A lot of them are going to have inflated salaries because they're competing with other people and you're a new esports team and you don't have a brand. Now, 100 Thieves can pick up content creators for a lot less because 100 Thieves is a team that has that brand equity. So a person is going to be interested in joining them by virtue of the fact that they can grow their brand with them. That is not the case for somebody that's starting their esports team from the ground up. Basically, I'm going to make a case for you in this talk that this is always the wrong way to start an esports team. Anyone that does this is essentially doomed. And this is always the right way to start an esports org. So sponsors care about impressions, uh, engagement, and eyeballs. 100 Thieves immediately had Cash App, right? Had uh, Tortinos. Um, and I think uh, when we did the original video that we did on the 100 Thieves compound, by that time, I believe they had Red Bull as well. They had like something like seven or eight sponsors that basically paid for the entire thing. They did that because they went content first. And then later they took on investment and they did everything. So why are we talking about this? Because this is what OTK did. OTK went 100% this route and we're seeing the beginning of this. So OTK started off and said, we're going to go content first. And right now what they're doing is they're just thinking about how do we provide the most amount of valuable content to people and we'll, we'll cover all the esports stuff later. And yes, they are making a statement that they are an esports org. They picked up CDU's teams, one of the best teams in World of Warcraft, debatably the best team in World of Warcraft. They picked them up. So they're making a very firm statement. Yes, we are getting into esports. And yes, we are going to be sponsoring esports. And yes, we are going to be planning to pick up other teams as we feel it out and as expenses allow. However, we are not going to join some big-ass league, make a ton of expensive plays, and we are, not, we are going to grow organically based on content. If we look at the list of things that Asmongold has stated that he is going to do, all of this stuff is content that they're going to be doing together uh, as part of the team. The smartest thing that OTK did and the thing that made them Devin Nash proof against criticism is at the beginning, they completely identified that these three people are going to do nothing. Okay, that was immediately what, like, if, like, because as soon as this announcement came out, I had, I, I just had my juice, dude. I was like, oh, I'm ready. I'm going to make a YouTube video that blows this shit up because if these three people think that they're going to do anything in the business world, like, coming from a person who, who runs a full-time agency on top of trying to run a stream, it is impossible. But they, they pre-gamed it, they knew it, they planned it, okay? And I can't criticize them for this because they launched the org with two people that are stepping back full-time to run the business. That is absolutely imperative because there is no way that OTK is going to get off the ground if you have these streamers in front of it. And I think the thing that gets me the most excited about OTK is that they have been transparent with this from the ground up. They know exactly who they are, right? They're not pretending to be these big esports owners. And one of the main criticisms about them is probably going to be, well, they don't have any experience in esports. They're not going to know how to do things. Guess what? Nobody has any experience in esports. This shit's five years old, right? Nadeshot didn't have any experience in esports when he went into it. Hector didn't have any experience in esports when he went into it. George didn't have any experience in esports when he went into it. Reggie didn't have any experience in esports when he went into it. You don't need any experience in esports to do it. They're pioneers. They're defining the field. They already are endemic to Twitch. They're endemic to content. They know how to create good content. They understand it. You don't need to have that kind of knowledge to get into it. That's not an argument, right? So, they're, like, the... 
idea that they just need to, like, the only thing that they need to have is they need to have the awareness that these three individuals need to do what they do best, which is to, they need to be able to create authentic content from the ground up, and they need to do that the best they can and ideate it while Tips and Rich run the show. And um, I'm going to go over some of the challenges that I think they might have in a little bit and uh, where I think they need to be aware of that. But generally, if there was a way to start an esports org that I could recommend, I think this is it. This wasn't a half-assed announcement on Asmund Gold's stream where he just said, yeah, we're going to build an esports org. It should be cool. It was prepared. They told almost nobody. They came out with videos. They had two days worth of content for the announcement. So yesterday, they had the Mizkif stream, the Asmund Gold announcement, the S-Fan stream. It was eight to 10 hours of total content about OTK right off the bat. You could go and get your information. They had a YouTube channel prepared. They had a Twitter. They had an Instagram. Their Twitter immediately hit 30K followers after Mizkif stream. Their Instagram is probably even higher now. Their Instagram hit 10K, right? Uh, they had a plan. Then the next day, they had the cooking stream to bring it in and sort of reinforce, this is a group we're going to be doing things together. If all this was, was just a content network where these three streamers stream together, it would be brilliant. But it's more than that. The other thing that I think is really strong is that they identified that they are all in the same area. So Austin is like, like uh, Ms. Kiff and s have already been planning to build those two houses and put them together. And so um, they were already planning to do a lot of content together. To do that in the context of this org makes it even better. So I just feel like this was very well prepared. And I think it was really extremely thought out. And I think that they know who they are. And that's the most important thing. Because the biggest challenge you're going to run into is the lack of time. And over time, the lack of sort of uh, mental investment that people are going to put in. Streamers are notoriously lazy. It's very difficult for streamers to run businesses because they don't like the mindset that is required to build creative things is not the same mindset that is required to build um, businesses and to hire people and structure things. So it takes a very high self-awareness of that to make OTK succeed. Okay, so that said, what are some of the challenges that um, I think are going to happen as a result of this? And what is some of the, maybe some of the value that if, if they are going to like listen to this or read this, like what can they get out of it? So the first question I would have is what is your equity spread? You've got five people. So are they, so my questions are, are they investing equally in it? Uh, are they equity spread equally, which means you would divide a hundred by five, Right and you would get uh, 20 each. So is it five people, 20% in each? This is most likely the case. It's the simplest, probably under an LLC, which means that five people need to vote for any significant company decision. So how are you going to manage voting for significant company decisions with five people who don't get out of bed before 4 p.m. This is, I think, the challenge number one. It's that they, so this is not an insurmountable challenge. It's just something they need to think about, which is how do they figure out decision-making in such a way that it minimizes the requirement that Asmongold, Ms. Kiff, and S-Fan need to be involved? Because if you over-index them for decision-making, I think you freeze the company. Um, it becomes very, very difficult to do. That's challenge number one. There are ways to do this that make sense to me. Um, the easiest way is scheduled meetings. The second way is like community votes. But I, you just have to understand that when you're running a business... So let me just give you a couple of examples. Let's say you want to hire a video editor. Who makes the decision to hire that video editor? Is it all five of them? Okay, so the people that are saying in chat, the community votes on stream. Just chill, okay? The community is not going to vote on stream with who their hires are. 
The community is not going to vote on stream with who their treasurer is. The community is not going to vote on stream with the legality of a bunch of tax stuff that they have to do, right? There are people that need to make these decisions within the business. Who makes them? So for things like um, uh, this stuff, sure, the community can vote on it, but it still needs to be an internal decision that gets made within the company. Who makes that decision? How is the spread done? If it's all five of them that have to make decisions like this, it's going to be a shit show. Because all five of them making those decisions is never going to happen. So they have to delegate responsibility out to different people. I think that what this team needs outside of these five people is a COO type person. They need a person who is going to sort of organize everybody and then make decisions on operations. And they need to be more of like a board that oversees that group of people. This is similar to what 100 Thieves did. When Nadeshot came in, Nadeshot knew that he was not going to be able to make decisions in a business sense. And the first thing he did was he hired a bomb COO. The COO of, of 100 Thieves is an assassin, if you've ever looked into him. He is a, a nutty individual. And 100 Thieves has a crazy um, amount of really, really, really good business people that are on the business side of it. So that's the first thing they need to do. They need to be more of like a board than that, okay? Um, that's the, the, Because I think that if the equity spread is 20%, they all have equal decision-making power, then there's a, there's a danger of getting frozen. That is number one, okay? Number two is um, the, the second danger. So let's say this is like concern number one. Uh, concern number two is over over indexing. So what does that mean? Over indexing means this list right here is a very big list. This is a lot to do. Now granted, I don't expect a lot of this stuff to happen um, in the immediate future, but the number two problem they have to deal with is they need to be careful of being spread too thin too quickly. Because again, resources are, are limited. So they've talked about this quite a bit, and I think they're conscious of this. I think they're conscious of this to the extent that it, but it, it's just a different type of thing. Um, the time management, this, this all kind of like folds into concern number one, right? Which is like the, the, the time management type of thing. Um, and I think that I can sort of explain this concern number three, right? Is going to be um, revenue generation slash um, expenditures, uh, making money. We'll talk about this in detail in a second and kind of how to fix these problems. Spreading too thin too quickly kind of means that you do too much and you don't do everything well. And as a result, like you sort of just like sort of like fizzle because you're just trying to do too much. I think they have to be conscious. Again, this goes back to how much investment of time are these three putting into it? Because over time, they won't be able to do it. I'm telling you, I'm just as a person who runs a full-time company, like at an executive level, along with a stream, if I'm lucky, I can maybe get 15 to 20 hours a week into streaming, if I'm lucky. And I have to, and I have to be conscious of so much shit. And, that, and, that, and I think, um, just like speaking, and this is with a, with a history of my entire life of running businesses. It is very, very hard. So to their credit, they've identified this, they've talked about it a lot, and they think that they are, and, and bringing on these two, people to handle the business side and pull back from streaming is absolutely the best thing they could do. Again, like I said before, they made themselves Devin Nash proof and they, but like seal of approval because I would have gone super hard if this was just an organization of content creators that expected to do this while streaming full time. They've been very um, aware of this. Let's talk about revenue generation and expenditures and making money. A team like this is going to make money off of sponsorships. Now, because method is gone, OTK starting in World of Warcraft is the smartest thing they could have done. Because they are filling a vacuum that was left as a result of Method, and Method is not coming back. If they're smart, they will go through the list of sponsors from the last two years that Method has had, hit them up and say, hey, we're OTK. We know that you guys sponsored Method. We are planning to do a lot of similar stuff, and we have this team of content creators that already out of the gate has more impressions and engagement than Method did as a whole team. So if you guys sponsored those guys, 
hey, your budgets are probably cleared up and you're probably wanting to do it with that money. Take a look at us. And the first thing they did on the OTK website is you can look at the OTK website. The, OK, the OTK website is not done, but the first thing here is um, right here is we're looking for partners. Smart, right? And um, I have a good idea of a couple of people that I think I can introduce them to who would do platform sponsorships for everybody on the team. And I'm going to email them shortly, probably today, and I'll, I'll get them started on that. So I do think that this is a possibility. But, you're, but anyway, you're going to make money off of sponsorships. So most likely, the current expenditure of the team is being split between either the th these three, and if this is the case, they have a higher equity spread, or these five. And if that's the case, they have an even equity spread. You're going to, if they do it that way, even the multi-zillionaires that Ms. Kiff and Asmongold and all of them are, and S-Fan and whatever, they are still going to burn out of money incredibly quickly if they don't start getting, uh, if they don't start getting, they just, they can't even see, they, they, they can't even imagine it. Esports teams burn money like nothing you've ever seen. So they have to grow proportional to the revenue generation that comes from sponsorships. The first thing they should do is they should reach out to everyone who did who worked with Method and every single sponsor that worked in the World of Warcraft space. If I were them, unironically, I would probably get an agency to help for the first like six to eight months. And you would have that agency basically do a really simple deal. We take, we uh, non-exclusive, we take 20% of everything that we bring you and then you have the deal. That way they engage a sales force um, for their stuff in addition to the sales that they're doing. So the it doesn't have to be by agency, though we'll do it, um, but it should be an agency that, uh, there's, there's several agencies in the space that could do it, but they should have an agency non-exclusively represent, so, they, so basically what they're doing is they're leveraging a separate sales team at the same time as their sales team goes after people. Does that make sense? So they ha they're they making two sales teams work for them. And that way, they leverage their sponsorships quickly so they don't run out of money. That's what they should do. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That happens all the time in the space. It's totally fine. Totally fine. Miz and Asmongold alluded to creating their own sales team. Thoughts? They will not be able to get a sales team off the ground fast enough to be able to um, beat their expenditure. You need someone to help them with it. The problem is that to get those people off the ground, teach them how to sell. There are not, take it from me, okay? I hire salespeople a lot in this space. I have to train them from the ground up. There are not a lot of good salespeople in this space, especially people that can do outbound. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of endemic knowledge, and it's not one-to-one. -one. You need to train those people from the ground up. There is no way that they hire salespeople quick enough to beat their expenditure. They need help. For the first eight months, they should get help uh, with it. And then after that, they can build that up from the ground up. And, and they, can do the, they can do both at the same time. You just get an non-exclusive sponsorship. Get an agency that knows what they're doing and have them toss you deals or multiple agencies or whatever. It's, it's, it's very simple. You basically lose, you, you lose a small cut of it, but in exchange, you basically support your team while you're building your own sales team. Then when you're ready, you branch out, you have your own sales team, you kill it, tell the agency thanks, or maybe still work with them, whatever. Pretty simple. That's how you beat this. Otherwise, I think they're going to burn out too quickly. They, there's no way in business, no matter how much financial planning you do, you cannot predict how much money you are going to spend on stuff. As a rule, you will always spend about 20 to 40% more than you project. You always spend more. Uh, the fourth one and the last one is what I'll call entropy. So entropy is basically um, over time the hype lessens and the team kind of fades into uh, a normal flow. And I feel like this is where offline TV is to some extent. Offline TV started off as like really intent on creating content together and they've slowed down over time because of entropy. As time goes on and we're a year and a year and a half out from this announcement, how will they keep together in this hype? It's a, it's a, it's a hard question to solve. There is no answer to entropy, just like there's no answer um, in the 
uh, in, in OTV. There's no answer. What happens? Like, here, and here's like the real spooky thing, okay? Um, a very prominent esports CEO called me. I'm just going to tell a story, okay? This is one of my best stories. A very prominent esports CEO called me one night, a couple years back. It was like 2 a.m. He calls me on the phone, and I'm like, what's up, dude? And he says, Devin, I legitimately feel like every esports team is one girlfriend away from annihilation. <laughs> and I thought a lot about that. <laughs> and it's actually true, dude. It's actually true. Like, you're all living together. You're 24, you're 23, whatever. It's cool. What happens when, like, you're kind of sick of being up at 3 in the morning with people yelling, you want to spend some time with your girl and someone kicks down your fucking door with a streaming IRL backpack, right? Like this was something that we started to see at CLG. Like people are getting girlfriends. They're getting a little bit more serious. They want their own apartments. Like people slow down. It's cool when you're like in your mid twenties or whatever. If you're an old motherfucker like I am, dude, you don't want to deal with that shit. I lived in a team house for four years. Okay. And like, it was fun. Sure like driving people to the hospital at 2 a.m. or whatever, um, the content or whatever. At this point, man, I want my shit. I want my stuff in Seattle. I want my girl. And I just want to go to bed. Leave me alone. I'm old. I'm fat. And I don't care. Okay? And they will get to this point. So I think that entropy is something that you have to really think about in the long term. How do you keep yourself interested? It's just something that has to be con you have to be conscious of. It's not something that's it, it's it's ultimately entropy is going to be insurmountable, right? Like they're they're not going to get to the point where at sixty years old they're like, well, that's great content. Like that, that they've got to think about. This is something that every streamer should think about. But um, over the next like one to two to three years, as this as this org kind of like builds itself, they have to think about it. There is a lot of drama that can happen in a team house of any kind and a streamer house of any kind. I don't care how good you think your friends are. Um, there's, there's going to be drama, dude. <laughs> there's going to be drama. I'm telling you, I lived in team houses for four years. It doesn't matter how good of a friend you think that you have. You could do it, but man, I've seen, this is why as a whole, Esports teams moved away from houses. There's also a big liability concern because when I was sitting with like the Madison Square Garden lawyers and I was talking about like team houses and what went on with them, they're just like, dude, we got to get these people, these apartments. This is fucking insane. I can't believe you guys did this. There's a lot of liability issues. Um, just, just like from a, from a, from a purely business standpoint, let's talk about food. Okay. Like, let's just talk about food. Um, all right. Any kind of food that's served in a business needs to be, uh, is it FDA? Are those the guys that do it? Somebody has to come to your fucking shit, inspect it, stamp it on a regular basis. There are so many things, right? You need to, you need to like in America that you need to do. You don't even want to like think about it. And I'm telling you, there are so many things that when it comes into building a house or whatever, for now, they're just going to get away with just like not thinking about it. But like later on, as the business sort of evolves and they're, they're claiming it as a business, this stuff starts to be kind of concerning. For this reason, it's why esports moved away from team houses. They just didn't want to deal with the liability. They didn't want to deal with the uh, with the workman's comp. They didn't want to deal with all that stuff. So entropy is the fourth thing. So overall, that's the four concerns I have. You've got you've got equity spread. You've got over indexing. You've got revenue ge generation and entropy. These are concerns that I would have for relatively any esports team. Um, I think overall, this is this is something that I would say. If you were going to structure a esports organization, I think that they structured this pretty much the best that it could be structured. I'm extremely proud of these five individuals. And I give one true king, the official Devin Nash seal of approval. I think it's going to work. I think that it is a really interesting proposition in this space that uh, it's something that is sorely needed after the vacuum that Method created. And I think it's going to be something way more than Method ever did. I think that it's going to, that, that if all it manages to do is bring together content creators and think up some unique business ideas, 
then I think that in of itself is very powerful. But I think that it will do even more than that. And I think that um, already these are some of the most... The, the thing that differs, the, the like all three of these creators are people who have moved Twitch forward in some unique way that no one else has done. Asmongold has done content that no one else has seen on Twitch. Sfan has done content no one else has seen on Twitch. And Mizkif does stuff that no one else has done on Twitch. So I think that for them to have come together to make this is kind of possibly the best of all worlds. And I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. Um, there are challenges. There's challenges to starting with any business. But they've set it up the right way. And I think that building organically from the ground up is 100% the right move. And the self-awareness that they have, the self-awareness that they have, which is like, we know who we are. They're being very transparent about who they are. They know that they are not going to be able to invest a lot of time into this, but I think even they underestimate how much time this is going to take. If, like, I think the number, like going through all these concerns, if they build a solid executive team and they answer these concerns, they get an agency that will support them in the short term and they figure out how to index their decision making and funnel it into, you know, one or two executive level individuals. I think this team is going to be very successful as they focus on making great content starting with World of Warcraft, not going too ham. And they could have started with like three esports teams. They started with one in one area. In their key area of expertise, everybody plays World of Warcraft. Everybody has a huge audience on World of Warcraft and they're all super into it. They can expand as they, as they grow in sponsorships. Pay attention. If this is for all the people that are ever going to ask me, if you're going to start an esports org, this is the way to do it. They followed the 100 Thieves model and they're going to get rewarded because of it. The thing that they could do, I think if another thing real quick is like, if you're having a problem with short to revenue generation, the number one thing that you should do is you should do a merch drop as fast as possible. A merch, and I say drop intentionally. I don't, I don't say like permanent store. They should do a first drop with limited edition stuff, five to seven items, do a drop, last until supplies are sold out, that will give them a lot of capital to burn while they look for sponsors and while agencies kind of spin up and look for sponsors for them. A merch shop would be the most logical thing to do in the shortest time frame. And based on this, like they could sort of correspond with like maybe a Dungeons and Dragons campaign or I mean, I'm trying to look at like what I think or like the clip review show launch or anything like that because I think these are like short term things. Shadowlands is not going to be out for like 2 billion years. So I think that that's like probably too far out. I'd say that's what um, they could do. A merch drop makes the most sense to me for short-term revenue generation. And you could do a merch drop every three or four months. So that would be just like once a quarter, four a quarter, and you'd probably get your revenue generation started off right there. All the, the influencers that are involved already are enough to make, like, make a merch drop like a huge thing. And merch drops are like not that complicated logistically to do if you have two full-time people that are working on it. What else? Merch drop shores up your short-term cash problems. Agency does the rest. Then you build a sales team and you're good. You got your events, which are all going to be pretty successful. You kind of dominate the wow category. You're filling a vacuum. Pretty solid, man. Pretty solid. I'm proud of them. I really am. Like, it's it, it shows a lot of thought. It shows that they've put a lot of pre preparation into it. And I am an official OTK fan. Which is, uh, that, that's high praise. I don't, uh... It's very rare that I say that I think an esports team is going to work. <laughs> it is super, super rare, but I think they will. I think they will. Like I said, the official Devin Nash seal of approval. Let's go. Very smart. They do not disappoint. And I think it's cool, too, that... Uh, they're all people that I respect as content creators a great deal that I've talked to on some level. Pretty neat.
That's it. That's the talk, I think. Um, if you're ever looking into how to build an esports org, this is the way to do it. You want to follow the 100 Thieves model. You want to follow the, um, the OTK model. You want to start with content first. You want to start with a strong leadership of content creators. And you want to build into your brand. You want to create a feel for it. The most important thing for this team over the next three months, six months is the feel. And they've already kind of got it, right? They've kind of got it. They're sort of scrappy. They're sort of like, yeah, we get out of bed at 2 p.m. Yeah, we're we get, like, I change my shirt once every two days. I run after and I put on the robe and I have the sword and everything. Like, that's the sort of the feel of the organization. It's super authentic, sort of real. I think they should keep going with that. They should, they should, they should play with that. Like, I think that's really good. There's a, there's going to be a brand feel that over the next like three to like six months is going to be really important to get a hundred thieves did it right. They did, they did the feel of like, um, we're like streetwear. We're cool. Even though we're nerds, we're like, we're like legit. Like you feel like, like really cool being a part of us. I think that, um, if OTK captures that basement dwelling troglodyte feel over the next like three to six months, that authenticity will build trust and fans in the team and will be really successful. They need to keep with that theme. The, one of the most important things that they can think about over the course of the next like uh, three to six months is like, how do we structure our esports team and our brand and our feel? It's one of the most important things. If you're building a company, one of the most important things is how do you feel to people? That's like, like, like with our agency, with Novo, the agency is ethical, authentic, authentic ethical. That's it. Like, we send Kotaku and Wired our contracts. You want to see our contract, I'll send it to you. I don't care, right? I'm super transparent. Ethics first. Ethically empowering people. I wanted to get the fuel of our organization off the ground to be, we are focused on ethics. That's it, right? So getting the feel of your brand right is the most important thing. And that is a thing that a lot of esports teams are missing. Even the teams that bought into the LCS or the CDL or, o or OWL, their problem is they never built a feel. Like what like look at all the teams on the LCS list. And I don't like wanna I don't wanna like name specific teams. So like we all know who they are, but think of some of the teams in the LCS right now in the North America LCS. And like most of them, do you get like a feel for like what they are and who they are? Not really, right? Like look at like CDL and OWL. Do you get like a feel for what they represent and how they feel? And what's crazy too is like you can lose this. Like if you don't keep up with it, you can kind of lose it. Um, they don't really have like a unique feel to them. So like what OTK did so well is they launched off. They might have done this accidentally. I just think because of the type of people that they are, the type of people these creators are. They might have done this accidentally. They launched with a feel. 100 Thieves launched with a feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could use, we could talk about CLG because CLG is like my... My, my previous team, so, like, we can talk about that. But, yeah, it's, like, a pretty good example. Like, what does CLG feel like, right? Um, at the time when we were building the brand, we had the idea that CLG would kind of feel like a family, and it would kind of feel like a close-knit community. And we had that for a long time, and it did really well. And that was also when it performed the best. But nowadays, like, CLG has lost that feel, right? It doesn't, like, really feel like anything. It doesn't, like... It doesn't like feel like a like like a like something like and that brand feels something you don't want to underestimate. Like in fact, like I think it's something that as a business owner you should probably think about maybe more than almost anything else. It's really really important, and OTK has succeeded in doing that. I think that's the hardest thing to do as a business: define your brand. So OTK coming out of the gate with like the basement dwelling troglodyte market. It's great. The only esports brands I've really seen do that are like a hundred thieves, optic, phase, as much as I don't want to admit it. OTK came out of the gate with that that feel. You know, I may not agree with the feel, but they got it. And other teams are sort of just like a tier below that. Okay, I've been talking too long. That's enough. I'll answer some questions. We'll chill out for a couple of minutes, but I think that is my talk. I hope you guys enjoyed it. This entire talk will be on YouTube, which if it is and you're watching it right now, you should subscribe to my YouTube. I'm trying to make a push for 100,000 subscribers, which would be really amazing because I had a goal of having 10,000 subscribers this year and I'm at 83,000 as of this talk, which is super cool. So if you go to my YouTube and you hit the subscribe button, uh, you are helping me out immensely to get to my goal of 10xing my results over the case of one year, which is a dream come true for me. Uh, that would be amazing. I'm going to link it in chat. 
and uh, I just really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, it'd be really amazing. So this video will be up tomorrow, and I hope you guys got a lot out of it. If you guys are watching this from OTK, uh, I will be invoicing you shortly for my advice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Thanks for watching.